God bless you. Thank you, Lord. But we appreciate you being with us this morning. Thank you, Lord. Good to see the sun shining this morning. Very pleasant out. <clears throat> Seemed like the last few years, May's been a little bit slow warming up, but uh, it beats that cold weather any day, at least for me. Huh? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Don't you appreciate the worship team? Give them a hand this morning. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Well, we're going to, uh, last, late, late last fall, early winter, I was doing a series called Holy Fire. I'm just going to, uh, I've had some other thoughts uh, concerning especially the very beginning of that series that I'd like to share. I just did some teachable moments this week around those areas, but you're pretty limited. You know, you only got five minutes. I try to say as much as you can in four or five minutes. And, uh, and, but I'd like to expand upon that. We talk about getting ready. I believe that this, this kind of message helped get the church get ready. You know, the church needs to be in condition just like anybody else, you know. You know, if, you, you know, if you're going to play sports, you've got to be in some sort of condition. If you're going to uh, serve the nation, you've got to, you know, be in some sort of condition. The same thing is true in law enforcement. A lot of positions in life, you've got to be in some sort of condition. Well, the same is true in relationship to the church. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to teach and to preach your gospel. We thank you, Father, that your word's good seed. And as it's sown on good ground in our lives, we believe that it will produce good fruit. And we thank you, Father, for these things in Jesus' precious name. And everybody agreed, said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We want to say those that are listening online, we, we appreciate your being with us. We ask you to, if you would, to, uh, you know, let us know that you're there. If you've got a question, I try to look at those at the end of the service and, and, uh, and try to get an answer to folks. Uh, you can also post a prayer request there. We always ask people to like it, love it, share it, uh, you know, and we ask our church family to do that too. Thank you, Lord. You know, I just uh, pretty regularly uh, 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 am getting some sort of response where people reach out to me personally and will say, you know, they, you know, somebody got saved or, or would you please pray for us? So, uh, you know, those sorts of things make a difference, and we appreciate your help in those areas. Again, we are uh, uh, doing this series, calling it uh, Holy Fire. Let's just begin by talking about these three elements that, if you will, that uh, have the ability, this wind, rain, and fire. Now, we're not going to be dealing with all three, but there are these three elements. Wind. Everybody say wind. Everybody say rain. And everybody say fire. Now, these three elements have the power to change the landscape of the earth. They are a force of nature. Rains come and floods are, have the capacity once again to change the course of rivers, wash away banks. I mean, it's a powerful force. Wind comes, strong is able to, if you will, under certain conditions. We don't look forward to it. We don't. We do not believe in for it. We 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 believe we believe uh, uh, we we believe for calm. But you know, sh strong winds can level communities. And then there's fire. Fire not only that could break through a neighborhood, but you see many of the fires that sometimes burn uh, out in out west where there's a tremendous amount of brush and tremendous amount of timber and and it it again it changes changes things well those same three elements are also expressions of the holy spirit and those three expressions have the ability to do this to transform the climate of the church that wind that rain, and that fire. Let's just look at a few examples when we're talking about wind and rain and fire. You know, there was a group back in the, back in the 60s called Wind, Rain, and Fire. 
I don't think they were biblical, though. Thank you. That was so long ago, John was DJing. He DJed so, so far long ago that Carrie DJed after him. I know everything about anyone. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. Acts, the second chapter, verse 2. We talk about wind. You know, the Bible says a lot about the Holy Spirit in relationship to wind. I'll just use this one verse because all three of them you can account for in Acts, the second chapter, when you look at the birth of the church. I think understanding the birth of the church is enormously important. You know, we know everything about, about the birth of our kids, how long they were, how much they weighed. We know their color of their hair, or if they didn't have hair. If you will, we, we photograph, and if the parents don't, the grandparents do. Every moment of their first two weeks. I used to love that when, you know, uh, you know things have changed so much, but you know, you know, before we had all these phones and stuff, you know, somebody they'd say, would you like to see a picture of my grandchild? And they would pull out their wallet and it'd go, Pum! it'd fall all the way to the floor, you know. And I'd say, no, I don't have all afternoon. I just want to see a picture. Yeah. Anyway, we, if you will, we, we chronicle every moment of it. We ought to know something about the early church. In Acts 2, you know, Jesus had already spoke to him in Acts first chapter. Go wait in Jerusalem. Tell you receive power from upon high. And Acts 2 2 says this. This is about 40 days in, or it is 40 days in. And it says suddenly. Everybody say suddenly. I like that. One of these days a suddenly is going to happen. Can you say amen? And suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house that was setting. And I tell you, that wind transformed the climate of the church. It changed their lives. God spoke to the prophet. He said, can these bones live? He's in the valley of the dry bones. He said, yea, Lord, only you know whether or not they can live. He said, prophesy to these bones. He began to speak to the winds. The winds began to blow. And the dry bones began to take on life. There's wind. Then there's rain, Acts 2, 16 and 17. You'll find in Joel. In Joel, the second chapter, it talks about a great outpouring. It says there'll be a former rain and a latter rain. Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that great outpouring. So when you talk about the heavens opening up, well, many times if we're talking about a natural sense, it's, my goodness, you know, all of a sudden the heavens opened up and it just, you know, it just rained. He says, this is that on that day. It was astounding what happened that day. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and it should come to pass when? In the last days, says God, I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Well, if anybody has ever lived close to the last days, it's you and I. There's what? There's rain. But then there's this, there's fire. Next, 2-2. Two, two. Now understand, this is not the only expression of fire. Moses standing before a bush that's not consumed, but it was a, it was a fire. Took off his shoes is what is holy ground, is what is holy fire. Holy fire. As the children of Israel crossed the desert, there was a pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. All of these are expressions of what? The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. I've often said that people are, they're, they're much more comfortable talking about the fatherhood of God and the person of Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and my, we should be. But we're not always as comfortable when we're talking about that third person of the Trinity. Acts 2, 4, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Is it what? A rushing mighty wind. Filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared to them cloven tongues. What was it like? Fire. Sat on each of them, and they were all filled what? with the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about fire. Let's talk about fire. Again, we're talking about these three powerful elements. And in, once again, in, in nature, they're able to change the landscape of the earth. 
You know, there's a fire that we are dreadfully concerned about, and that's everlasting fire. That's a fire of punishment. There's also a, a holy fire. Fire will produce these, these three things. Purity, passion, and power. Say that with me. Say purity, passion, and power. Can I tell you the church needs all three of these? I like purity. Man, I'm a guy. I like passion. How'd you like to have a marriage without passion? I'm going to tell you, God don't like a church without passion. Think about it. You wouldn't want a, you wouldn't want a marriage without passion. I have far too many people of, you know, people of, of faith. And listen, I'm not one to question people's faith. But good people of faith have long since lost their passion. Long since lost their passion. They're much more passionate about other things. They've lost their passion for God. What kind of relationship is that with for the Lord? And then finally, there's the third element that fire produces, and it's, it's power. You know, if you take those three elements, you know, and, and if you harness them, we talk about wind, rain, and fire. Uh, you know, I do think that one of these days that they'll be able to do a better job of harnessing wind power, and it'll become much more effective someday. But we've used wind for several thousand years. Run windmills, move water, push ships across the ocean. Wind is what? When it's harnessed, it's a powerful force. Rain, when it hits the earth and as it gathers, how necessary the water is to, to provide electricity, to provide life. You harness the power of fire and, it's, and it produces, can produce steam. It's what's behind the coal-fired plants. You need what? You need fire. Now, passion without purity is this. It's just purely empty. You know, passion without purity will lead to this infidelity. Yeah. Passion without purity leads to infidelity. Passion without purity is empty, and purity always precedes power. Purity always precedes power. Many in the church, especially in, when you get to the Pentecostal charismatic circles, I, you know, they, they're all about that power part. I, I, I got a red alert for them. They better be all about the purity part. Listen, I can say that. I'm, I'm, I'm one of them. Okay? This is, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not somebody that's against all that. I don't believe the correction ever comes from without. It always comes from within. Matthew 21, 12 and 14. Then Jesus went into the temple of God. Listen to this. Did I tell you? The purity always comes before what? Power. Jesus went where? Okay. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Know you not that you are the what? What word are we, Ray? The temple of God. Where did Jesus go? To the temple. Do you know that the Holy Spirit dwells in the temple of God? Jesus is, once again, he, he went into the temple of God. What did he do in the temple? Oh, yeah. He drove out... All those who bought and sold in the temple, and listen, I'm for that today. I'm for kicking out the money changers. Now listen, I'm not anti again. I'm not against God's blessing, His goodness, His provision. No, I'm I'm all for it. I'm all on board. I, I but I don't got no time for the money changers. 
Listen, if somebody's going to sell you a cloth for $25 to get your healing, keep your money. Call us. We'll pray for you for free. For free. And believe God. Not cash your check and throw your letter away. Money changers. Buying and selling. I'm going to tell you, the anointing of God is not for sale. But it's real. Timothy says in the last days, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You know what lovers of pleasure means? Friend of pleasure. Philios. Friend of pleasure. Well, we got a lot of that today. Friend of pleasure rather than a friend of God. Denying the what? Power thereof. From such what? Stay away. Yeah, there's the other side of that spectrum too. Then Jesus went in the temple. He drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. And he what? And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who what? Who sold doves. Now, just for the lack of time, I, obviously the next verse he says, you know, my house should call, be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. So there's that place to talk about it also being a, you know, a house of power or a temple of, or, or a house of prayer or a temple of prayer. But just for the lack of time, because I know myself, I'd get caught up. So after he ran out the, those who bought and sold, after he cleansed the temple, it says, and then, everybody say then. It's not a big word, but it's an important word. Then. What's then mean? Then means in the aftermath. Then the blind and the lame came to the temple, and he what? He healed them. It first must be a temple of purity before it can be a temple of power. What? Purity always precedes power. Principle. Scripture. Now, we said that fire will produce three things, purity, passion, and power. We're going to focus on purity. Focus on purity. I, I like passion. Uh, and who do want more of the power of God in their lives? Well, let's focus in on what? Purity. See, fire is also this. When we talk about fire, fire is also a cleansing force. Cleansing force. Even in, you know, long ago, the Indians would often burn things off. Burn the underbrush in the forest, burn the plains off. Why? Because it would cleanse the land. Fire is what? It's a, it's a cleansing force. It's powerful. Matthew, the third chapter, verses 11 and 12. This is John the Baptist. Not the first Baptist church, John the Baptizer. You know, I had somebody tell me one time, said the King James Bible was good enough for John the Baptist, it's good enough for me. Yes, it is funny. And you know what? I'm, I'm, they love Jesus, you know what I mean? We need to pay a little more attention than that, though. All right, he wasn't a Baptist, he was a baptizer. And I'm all for the Baptist. Can you say amen? Yeah. I'm for everybody who calls Jesus Lord. I, I am a guy that's into unity. Yes, sirree. We, you know, I'm all for finding a way that we can walk and work together. Now, you don't deny the blood of Jesus Christ, His sacrifice, His atonement on the cross. You can be wrong about something. With water, I baptize those who repent of their sins. But someone is coming far greater. Now, we're talking about, you know, that they've, they've repented. In the aftermath of repenting, they were baptized in water, symbolic of being what? Cleansed, right? From their sin. But John says this, there's something greater than being cleansed by water. You ever think about it that way? There's something greater than being cleansed by water. 
Someone's coming who's far greater than I am. He says, so that I'm not even worthy to carry your shoes. Do you know in their households they had servants? A Jewish servant never had to carry shoes. It was always the Gentiles. John says, in comparison to him, I'm lower than a Gentile. I'm not worthy to carry his shoes. Now he says this, remember there's one coming, what? Greater, right? So there's something greater than water baptism. I like saying this. I like teaching these things. Water baptism is, I believe in it, man. We, we practice it. We're going to have a baptismal service here the first Sunday in June. I believe in water baptism. You haven't been baptized, great opportunity. Amen? Water baptism is, is important. It's essential. It's, it's one of the ordinances of the church. In water baptism, we, we identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We're commanded to do it. We follow Christ in obedience in doing it. But water baptism is men baptizing other men or woman. I'm an equal opportunity guy. There's neither the Jew, nor Greek, nor bond, nor free, nor male, nor female. For all are one in Christ. So that's, that's people baptizing other people in water. And I'm all about gender, okay? I like gender. But remember that greater? He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Everybody say fire. That's what it says, isn't it? There's something greater than water baptism. How's that? That's not my... That, now, listen. That's not my misinterpretation. This is what he's saying. There's something greater than water baptism. And boy, how, how important is that? You're identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Is that my trivializing? No. I, I, if you hear it that way, you've mistaken. Oh, no. You're identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. It is our public profession of faith. We're telling the whole world we trusted in him. With water, I baptize those who repent for their sin, but somebody's coming far greater than I. I'm not worthy to carry his shoes, but he shall baptize with what? With fire. We keep going. And he will separate the chaff. Now, here we get down to life, okay? Here we get down to life. This is real living. And he will separate the chaff from what? The grain. Burning what? The chaff with a never-ending fire. And storing away the what? Now, the grain is profitable. The grain is beneficial. This takes place on the threshing floor. Often just on a, on a knoll. Up just a little bit high where there's just a little bit more breeze. That would clear out an area. Somewhere around 20 meters. Maybe 30 meters. They'd spread the grain out. They'd either beat it, or they'd bring in an oxen or a donkey, and they would, and they would, it would be beaten under its hooves. Then they would come in with these 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 forks, and they begin to throw the grain in the air, and the chaff blows away. And God's intent is for it to burn. In the fire. He's what separates the chaff from the grain. Now the grain is out of a value. But you know what the chaff is? The chaff is worthless. And you can't benefit from the grain. Listen to this. There's no benefit with the grain until you remove the chaff. Though the grain is in there and it's enormously valuable. It's, it's needful. But unless you remove the chaff, you never get to the grain. They say we're talking about fire. Here's what chaff, chaff in the Greek, trivial, worthless, trash. So the chaff is the trivial, the worthless, and the trash in our lives. It's what? The trivial, the worthless, and the trash. He wants to separate the what? The grain from the chaff. 
the valuable from the invaluable. The necessary from the absolute unnecessary. The trivial. We got trivial stuff. Some of it's worthless. Some of it's worse than that. When something's really bad, we often call it what? Trash. Trash. See, the Holy Spirit will do this. When you have a fire on the inside, remember he said he baptized you with the Holy Ghost and fire. When that fire, when the Spirit of God is on the inside of us, Understand, we're talking about expressions of the Holy Spirit, but we are talking about Him burning in our lives, in our hearts. He'll burn out the trivial things in our lives. He'll burn out the worthless stuff in our lives. And He'll burn the trash out of our lives. See, this is the thing that what gets you ready. Gets you ready. See, we've been saved in the Spirit of God. He lives on the inside of us. This powerful third person of the Trinity lives in our lives. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Scripture is clear. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? He wants to burn in our lives. And when He is real in our lives, and when He is active in our lives, all the trivial and the worthless and the trash, that which tends to enclose and cover and encapsulate the valuable, what happens to it? He gets burned away. Now, I realize in that verse you can talk about ultimately impending judgment, but I could, I, could, I could show you lots of examples. You know that all sin in the end is going to die, but He wants it off of our lives. He wants all that to burn. We need that third person of the Trinity. We need that holy fire in our lives. Where there is no fire in the church, there is no purging. Well, Bill, I don't believe in things like that. And I know and there's no purging, and there's no fire, and there's no passion, and there's no power. So you can have what you believe for. Impure, unpassionate, and not powerful. It's not what I'm looking for. It's not what God wants. Where there's no fire... There's no purging. We're beyond checking a box, fulfilling an obligation. So you can make your, you, you can make your worship, worship trivial. Trivial. I said a prayer. Don't trivialize it. Where there's no fire, there's what? There's no purging. There's also no passion. There's no power. In Zechariah, the 13th chapter, in verse 9, he says, And I will bring into the fire, and I will refine who? Them. Them is you, them is me. We're talking about the refiner's fire. I will what? I'll bring them into the fire. I realize that there's the fires, or just the trials of life are fire. They are. First Peter, the first chapter, verse 7. Know you not that faith tried in fire is more valuable than gold that perishes? But listen, there's also the fire of the Holy Spirit burning on the inside of our lives. The early church, again, you examine it. They're pure. They're passionate. And it's powerful. Zechariah, the prophet, the Lord speaking through him, I, I will bring into the fire, I will refine them like silver, and I will test them like gold. Gosh, just a little bit of, you know, background on, you know, we have all see things. There's, they got more gold programs on TV right now, and you can imagine. 
But you know, we know when you, you, you take the gold, you take the silver, and you know, and they and they heat it. And when they heat it, all the all the you know what comes to the top, the impurity. See, you're back to whether you're talking it, you're talking about it being chaff or the dross that comes to the top. But if you've got the Spirit of God, we've got him burning on the inside of us. What does it do? It brings the impurities to the top. And then when they come to the top, they're easily dealt with. They're not only easily dealt with, they're obvious. They're obvious. See, we want him to work in our lives in this way because I want to, you know, I want my passion to be pure. And I want to get to the place where it's powerful. I want my prayers to be powerful. I want my witness to be powerful. For him, not for my sake. For someone else's sake. And so that first time, and they heated up, and my goodness, they heated up. And they began to pull the impurities off the top. And then they heat it again, and they examine it again. But finally, they heat it and tell. You know what they can see? Their reflection in the gold or the silver. Know ye not, all right, that ye are made in the image of God. See, so you get that fire burning on the inside and it burns out the dross. It deals with the chaff. And then finally you get what? The Imagio Dei, the image of God. His reflection shining in our lives. I will what? I will bring into the fire. See, in our lives individually, and, 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 and all of us are dealing with something. We, we recently was dealing with the verse, lay aside the sin that does so easily beset us. And we all have a, 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 a sin, or we all have these particular things that are a greater stumbling block. It's a greater weight. It's a greater burden to us than, than maybe someone else. But nonetheless, the having that Spirit of God on the inside of us, our, our recognition of it. And see, my concern is so very few even recognize the Holy Spirit active in their lives. And so concerning me and my, my deals, my personality, my, my quirks, some of it's just trivial. But the trivial still matters. Understand that some of it's trash, and we all want rid of the trash, but sometimes harder dealt with than one would think. And this is why that we're not on our own. This is why we are dependent upon Him. This is why we need Him. We're talking about a what? A refiner's fire. A refiner's fire. Christianity is way too casual. We need a refiner's fire. A what? I'll refine them. It's a perfecting. I know when I got born again, I was separated, set apart. It was sanctifying. But I continue to need that work in my life. I need what? Refine. Not reborn. You know, a lot of people, we're trying to get them born again and born again and born again again. Does anybody know where the verse is where you can get born again again? And again. And again. No, but a lot of us need what? Refine. Does that make more sense to you? That we need refine. I need what refinement in my life? Refinement. Refining me helps make me more like him. More like him. You know, when a, when a baby's born, it's, you know, so many times you're able to look that child. Now, me, Linda, when, when a baby's born, I just always tell everybody it's beautiful, all right? I, and it's true. It is, isn't it? All right? Most of the time, I can't tell who it looks like. Tim, it looks like a baby. Now, Miss Linda, that would not be her. She could see who it looks like. Now, they got to get a little age on them. Now, as they get, begin to get a little age on them, I begin to see who they look like. Why? The... The refinement begins as they begin to mature. Amen? Refinement begins as you mature. And part of the maturing, maturing is once again, it's that fire, that, that fire burning on the inside of us. That 
purifying. There's this in that life. Oh, we all know what that this in our life is that he's dealing with. Listen. Just get before him and just, God, burn it in my life. Burn it out. Remove the chaff. Take away the, the trivial. Remove the worthless. Burn out the trash. Refine me. It's what? It's a refining process. Again, the gold's not refined one time. It's refined multiple times. See, in their day, the lots of the gold would, and, would come out of iron ore. It's not like today where you're watching them sift through the dirt and they just get little crystals. So, is it, no, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a process that took place. You know, church don't like processes. We like events. We like events. You know, graduation yesterday was an event. We all celebrated the event. It's a good event, isn't it? We're thrilled about the event. We're proud of the kids. There's no event without a process. We want to skip the what? The process. I'll bring them into the fire. I'll, well, I'll refine them. I'll, I'll perfect them. It's what? It's process. And they will call on my name and I will what? I'll answer them. If I go back there to, to Matthew, it's a, it's a house of purity. And then it becomes what? A house of prayer. And the house of prayer becomes a house of power. When the fire of the Holy Spirit burns hot in our lives, we've said this, we just say it again. When the fire of the Holy Spirit burns hot in our lives, sin is exposed and purity prevails. I mean what? Hot. I'd rather you be what? Hot. Or cold. At least there's a distinction there. At least there's a distinction there. See, just you know, that, that is a great measuring stick. You know, the scripture is filled with measuring sticks. We compare ourselves to one, you know, to one another. I can always find somebody that's not that's doing worse than I am. Isn't that a terrible thing? Be just looking for somebody who just does worse than you are. You can always find that. People aren't our measuring stick. Again, the scripture gives us a measuring stick. Am I hot? Am I hot? It's a great question to ask yourself. Am I hot? If I'm not hot, why, not, why, why am I not hot? I tell you, it's trivial. It's the worthless. It just has no value. And it could be trash. When he what? When he burns. When he burns on the inside of us. You remember the disciples were on the road to Damascus. The resurrected Savior walks up. They don't really recognize him because he's the resurrected Lord. They walk along the way and he shares the word. And finally they sit down in communion. And in communion, I really like that. In communion and serving the Lord's Supper as they're eating a meal. And they break bread in that communion moment, they recognize who he is. And then, boom, he's gone. Once again, it's one of those hair walk to the front of your head moments. He's gone. And they said this. And when he spoke, didn't our hearts burn within us? See, the word should cause our hearts what to burn within us. First Thessalonians. The fifth chapter in verse 19. It says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Who's he writing to? The church. They have the capacity to extinguish. That's what put out means. It means to extinguish. Do not extinguish the Spirit's fire. Why? Oh, He's meant to consume something in our lives. If there is no fire, there will be no 
purity. If there is no fire, there'll be no passion. And if there is no fire, there will be no power. His admonition to the church, to the Thessalonians, don't put out the Spirit's fire. But now listen to me. They had something. You can't put something out if it isn't there. It's already out. Sometimes you need to stir something up. God, search me, examine me, speak to me, talk to me, reveal yourself to me. He says to these Thessalonians, do not put out the Spirit's fire. You know, he goes on to say to him, despise not prophecy. Don't don't hold despite for the gifts of God. Why? Because it'll put out the Spirit's fire. Don't, don't hold in spite the, the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. See, the same Spirit that draws us to Christ is the same Spirit that makes us more like Christ. He says, do not, what? Quench. Again, that's what the King James says. What? Extinguish. Extinguish. You know, there's always, you know, people making, you know, wisecracks about things that happened in the church. If it's just not like what they would have done or the, you know, the way they see it or what history tells them, they'll throw a wet blanket on it. I'm telling you, there are way too many wet blankets. There's way too many wet blankets. Somebody say, God spoke to me in a dream. They'll say, now listen to me. It was what you ate last night. Yeah. 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 You ate something last night. The Lord said to me, listen to me. The Lord has already done all the speaking. It's right here. Listen, I, do I thank God for the Word? Well, I've committed the bigger part of my life to studying it. And He speaks to me when I read it. He speaks to me when I pray. Oh, it's, you know, it's not like, hey, Bill, how you doing today? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I try not to treat God like a buddy. I remember he's God. He's Father, but he's the Heavenly Father. Jesus is my Lord, but he's also my King. In his spirit, it is holy. He is holy. Do not put out what the Spirit's fire. Do not extinguish it in your lives. So many times that God will deal with this, and what we do is we resist it. You're extinguishing the Spirit of God. You know, people do that. You know, folks do that when they're coming to Christ. They resist His tug and His pull until they no longer sense it and end up hopelessly lost. God deals with us in our lives about things that we must give attention to. It must be dealt with. But it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it's making us more like Him. More like Him. You know, at some point, I don't know when it happened, but at some point in the church, maybe it was in the first century church, maybe it was in the first week, who knows, but at some point talking about sin and God dealing with it and taking it out of our lives became a negative message. Like we're giving something up. Giving something up. Sin's not something you give up. Sin's something you turn from. And holiness is something you turn to. Yeah, we turn to God. Don't put out what? The Holy Spirit's fire in your life. We need it. 
We need it. When we're worshiping, we, 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 if we're not careful, we find ourselves trying to put a cap on ourselves. I'm not, and this, 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 I, don't, I don't want to get too excited here. I feel, I feel tears. Let me fight them back. I sense rapturous joy. But I'm, 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 I'm carried away. Don't what? Don't experience the Holy Spirit's fire. I really sense I should call somebody. Oh, no, it can't, it can't be God. It can't be God. I really should help somebody. Oh, well, yeah, I, you know what? I, I need that money worse than they do. I'll hang on to that. See, we do little trivial things in our lives. It extinguishes the work that he wants to do. We're instructed. Do not put out the Spirit's what? Fire. He's wind. He comes and he, he's out. There's an outpouring. He's likened to rain. But he's also this, that fire, that fire. We need the fire of God. Active in the church today. Every head bowed. No one looking around. So I believe the Spirit of God is, He is the one who draws us to God. Convinces us who the Son is. Ultimately, He is the teacher. Pastor Bill's not the teacher. Lots of people can teach the word, but he's the teacher. He's the teacher. I'm a shepherd. He is the shepherd. If you're here this morning, he's the one who draws you to Christ. If you've never accepted Christ, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. If you've never said, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. We would like to give you an opportunity to do that. If you sense him working on the inside of you, don't resist that. Submit yourself to God. You resist the enemy. You resist evil, but you don't resist God. We submit ourselves to him. We surrender ourselves to him. Have you ever called Jesus the Lord of your life? If we've not made him Lord, he is not our Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Before he's your Savior, he must be your Lord. Oh, it happens simultaneously, but there must be a recognition of his Lordship. You're giving him full and complete control in your life. You're surrendering everything to him. You're not resisting him. Can you believe that Jesus Christ is God's own son? If you can, that is good. Can you believe that he lived a sinless life? You should. Do you believe that, that he was judged for you and there on the cross that he died for you? It was personal. And if you say yes, I'd say that is good. Do you believe in the resurrection? You might say, Bill, I, I celebrate Easter every year. Yes, I believe in the resurrection. And all that is wonderful. Then you can believe those things. But I, now I would ask you this. Have you made that one that you believe all those things about? Have you made him the Lord of your life? Have you had him, asked him to fully, fully take, take everything? I submit everything. I... I I give you my hurt, my pain. I need you to take my sin, but take my talent, my, my abilities, every, any, everything and anything you want. Your Lord, I'm submitting it to you. Have you ever asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? 
If you haven't, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. You might say, Bill, I've, I've certainly have known the Lord Jesus. I do love him. But I've, I've picked up that control. I'm in charge. I probably need to reaffirm my faith this morning. Now, you're not getting saved again. You're getting refined. But if you need to reaffirm that faith again, would you pray with us? Acknowledge that He is your Lord and that you set all those things before Him. You bring it all to the cross. We're going to pray and we're going to invite everybody in the room to pray. Have you ever asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? If you haven't, pray with us. If you're listening online, you can pray with us. Now, praying a prayer doesn't save you. It is believing in your heart that Jesus is God's Son, that He died for you, died for your sin, and He was raised from the dead. And it's asking Him to be the Lord of your life. Prayer is a means by which to achieve that. We're going to pray. The Bible says we can pray one for another, so let's all pray together. We'll pray for each other. If you've wandered in your faith and say, Bill, I need to reaffirm that faith this morning. I've, uh, I've, I've, I've picking up some things that I shouldn't. I'm redirecting my affection, my attention. He is Lord. You, would you pray with us also? Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. And I believe He died. I believe he died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. Old sin, old hurt, old habits. They're all passed away. Thank you for a brand new heart. A brand new beginning. Jesus, you are my Lord. I am God's child. Thank you for saving me now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father. With every head bowed, no one looking around, you might be here and say, Pastor Bill, that was me this morning. I, I wasn't certain where I was at, but when you prayed, I prayed also. Just look up real quickly. Nobody else will be looking around. We want to know who we might have prayed with or for. Just, just a brief moment. Thank you. Yes, God bless you. Anyone else? Give us another moment. Let's wait for our eyes to meet. Thank you. Thank you. Father, you look down from heaven. You see more than our eyes. You see our hearts. You see the decisions and the commitments people make. How important those are. Thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you that you fully forgive. And thank you, Father, for pouring out your love. God, I thank you. They're yours. They're part of your family, your children. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Lord, we love you. I believe right now you cause your love and your peace to be shed abroad in their hearts by your Holy Spirit, that the joy of their salvation would be real. God, I thank you for it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, in a few moments, there'll be prayer partners. I like to tell people, you should always tell somebody. There will be prayer partners. You can say, when Pastor Bill prayed this morning, I prayed with him, and they'd be glad to pray with you and encourage you. If you don't do that, tell somebody important in your life that you asked Jesus or you reaffirmed your faith, whatever the case might be. If you're listening online, the same is true. Tell somebody. See, he confesses us before the Father. We should confess.